So thank you for having me today. I'm really excited about um, sharing some highlights from my region with you all. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a long time and I'm really just happy to be here. I'm just gonna jump right in because I have a ton to say in 20 minutes or less. Uh, it was hard for me to keep within the time frame, so I'll get going. Um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today or theme for my presentation, I wanted to keep within the spirit of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Inclusion. And so I'm going to focus today's presentation on female leadership in criminal justice reform. Um, the female leadership in my region, particularly in the UP, just really stands out. And so I have two objectives today. First and foremost, I want to um, introduce you to some of the phenomenal women I have the privilege of working with. And um, second, I just want to share my region with you through a few uh, facts and fun pictures. So a little bit of background for those of you who don't know me. I um, started working for the commission in November of 2018. Uh, before that, I was a solo practitioner in Ogemaw County, and I was responsible for Ogemaw's inaugural compliance plan and cost analysis. And like so many other people across the state, I was learning to adjust and adapt and kind of figure out MIDC's new standards. And I had one month of implementation under my belt before I came to work for MIDC. One of my first tasks as regional manager uh, was to familiarize myself with the various compliance plans in my region and also to become acquainted with the stakeholders in my region. And Marla had been covering Northern Michigan um, prior to my being hired. And so she was making those introductions for me. And we planned a trip to the UP in November. And this was my first day in the field. Uh, Marquette had record snowfall that day, 8.9 inches. So here's the first fun fact. That broke the previous record um, back in 1984 of 8.4 inches. Commissioner Walker may remember that day. Um, we were supposed to, the three of us were supposed to drive up to Houghton and visit the new Tri-County Public Defender's Office. And Marla and I arrived at Commissioner Walker's home and he said, you know, come in and have a cup of coffee. We are not going anywhere. Mother Superior is speaking. And that was very good advice I've learned over the years of working in the UP. Um, I eventually I began covering going out in the field on my own. And my next trip was to the Western UP in January of 2019. And one of the first stakeholders I met uh, was Judge Bargland. And Judge Bargland was instrumental in launching um, implementation of the MIDC standards in her circuit. And she took leadership and drafted the initial compliance plans for both Dickinson and Menominee counties. Um, she's continued to do so each year up until this most recent fiscal year 22 plan. Judge Bargland has also been extremely helpful as we attempt to find ways to address the shortage of attorneys who are willing to take on indigent work in the UP. In December of 2020, Judge Bargland helped spearhead a series of panel discussions via Zoom in effort to educate folks about you know, what it's like to live up there. What do you do for recreation? We talked about opportunities to do indigent defense work in the UP. And I know as a result of those panel discussions, um, one PD office, Marquette, gained a new employee. So it was successful. In preparation for today's presentation, I asked Judge Bargland what her thoughts are on the evolution of criminal justice reform in Michigan, and I'd like to take a few minutes just to share a few of her thoughts with you. She writes, when I first started in criminal defense as an attorney, I was paid a very me meager lump sum every month, regardless of how many cases I was assigned. Requesting extra for difficult case cases was unheard of, even murder charges. It has always bothered me that criminal defense attorneys have been so underpaid. First, I believe the standards have already improved the quality of defense that I'm seeing. The attorneys are spending more time with their clients, filing motions and negotiating harder for plea and sentencing agreements. Also, when the quality of the defense bar improves, the reputation of attorneys and the justice system improves right along with it. 
when you pay attorneys appropriately for the work they take on, they don't have to take on so many other tasks to make ends meet and thus have more time to put into each case they handle. It's a win-win. Second, I also believe having an attorney present right at the first appearance has improved the criminal justice system as well. The fear and confusion I would see on defendants' faces at the initial arraignment when they were unrepresented is significantly reduced. <clears throat> Third, the training requirement has had a significant impact on the quality of defense from what I'm seeing. The attorneys have reported to me how much they've learned and enjoyed many of the training sessions they attended. Residing in such a remote area as the Upper Peninsula, legal training was often a luxury that time and money just didn't permit. So I see this as a huge improvement to the overall quality of the indigent defense bar. I could go on and on with how happy I am that the state of Michigan has made these improvements and put their money where their mouth is to help us. I so appreciate the hard work that was done on the task force and committees and commission to finally bring this all to fruition. And here, just a fun picture. This is a shot of the Dickinson County Courthouse, which is one of my favorites. I think it looks like a castle. This is where Judge Bargland um, sits on the bench, one of the courts anyway. And this courthouse was built in um, 1896 and then renovated in 1935 to include sleeping quarters for the jurors. How's that for jury duty? Also from Dickinson County, um, Andrea Mashik Lasilla is uh, an attorney there. She opened her practice in Dickinson County in 2018. And Andrea was very intentional about focusing her work on indigent defense. Um, when the system decided to implement a manage assigned counsel delivery model in 2022, Andrea stepped up to um, create an innovative COMAC management delivery system, the goal being to share the MAC workload and allow the COMACs to continue to manage their caseloads at the current level of service. Andrea initiated new processes for counsel at first appearance and also put processes in place for making attorney assignments. And right up the road in Crystal Falls in Iron County is uh, Abby Anderson. She's the chief at Iron Defense. Um, and when I asked Abby for a picture, she sent me this one. And she said it was the only one she had that didn't have her husband or her kids or her dogs in it. And I think that's a great reflection of how so many women like Abby managed to uh, keep up with a really busy, stressful career and also balance that family life. When I started working for MIDC, Abby was a solo practitioner and she took on the majority of the felony cases in Iron County. And in 2020, the funding unit decided to um, implement a nonprofit public defender delivery model. The funding unit put Abby in charge of building that office and then subsequently hired her as the chief. Something that stands out about Abby, um, when the pandemic started, she was very quick to act and uh, to ensure that the rights of her clients were protected, but also to ensure uh, compliance with the MIDC standards. And one of the things she did um, was implement a tablet for use in the jail so that the system could remain compliant with standards two and four. And these are just a few quick shots of the Iron County Courthouse. It is absolutely beautiful if you've never seen it in Crystal Falls. This is another old one. Um, the original courthouse was built in 1890 and the clock tower was added in 1910. And if you're lucky enough, like I was, to make friends with the custodian, he um, can unlock the door to let you up there so that you can get an amazing view. It's very cool. Um, this is Hannah Goodman. Hannah is, uh, she serves as the conflict attorney administrator for both Iron Defense and also for the Tri-County Public Defender's Office that covers Houghton, Verga, and Keweenaw counties. So with implementation of Standard 5, Hannah is responsible for making case assignments from the conflict rosters, for reviewing and approving the um, conflict attorney's invoices, and also uh, reviewing the request for experts and investigative services. She manages two rosters as well as a full-time law practice. So she's a very busy, busy gal. 
Next up in Munising, we have Jana uh, Mathau. She is the chief PD in Alger County, and they hired her in September of 2019. Some of you may recognize Jana. Uh, she was previously the Northern Michigan Regional Manager before me. Um, I first met her in trial college, and I have always known Jana to be a very zealous advocate for her clients. She has had several recent successes, trial successes, um, despite the pandemic. And just south, here's a fun fact, just south um, of Elder County is the Ebon Ice Caves. And this is a really cool, uh, not as well-known UP uh, site to see, but um, it's just south of Munising. Like I said, it's located in the Hiawatha National Forest. If you um, decide to go, I highly recommend you put ice cleats on your boots. It's about a mile hike back to the forest and you actually have to hike across private land, but the landowner lets you park there. They've got porta pots, a uh, little trailer set up with hot chocolate and ice cave swag. So you can get a sweatshirt or a t-shirt when you're done. And they don't charge for that. This is Catherine Denholm. Um, Catherine is in Manistique, Michigan. When Schoolcraft County transitioned to a managed assigned council delivery model, they contracted with Catherine to be the primary provider of services and also the MAC. So one of the biggest improvements um, in Schoolcraft County that Catherine identified is a decrease in incarcerations. And this is partially due to implementation of counsel at first appearance, where she can advocate for PR and reduced bonds um, early on in the case. Uh, a young woman by the name of Harley LaCrosse was admitted to the bar in June of 2021, and Harley is from Schoolcraft County, and so she returned there to practice after she passed the bar. Um, so the majority of misdemeanor cases to kind of break her in are assigned to Harley. So with Catherine taking the majority of cases, both felony and misdemeanors, and Harley picking up the misdemeanor conflicts, Schoolcraft essentially has an all-female bar. And a little north of the courthouse in Manistique uh, is one of my favorite UP attractions. This is the Big Spring, otherwise known as Kitchitakippi. The Big Spring is about 200 feet across, 40 feet deep, and over 10,000 gallons of water gush from the fissures that are at the bottom of that pool you see there. And if you've never been there, you get on that raft and pull yourself across via cable back and forth and the center of it is cut out and you can see straight down to the bottom. It is crystal clear, beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful places in our state as far as I'm concerned. And there are huge trout there, bigger than I've ever seen in the lower peninsula anyway. Next up, introducing Dakota Fountain. And uh, Dakota is the deputy chief public defender and um, Lauren Califf, the assistant public defender from the Marquette County Public Defender's Office. The Marquette County PD Office was established in 2019 with the launch of the first set of MIDC standards. And Patrick Crowley is currently serving as the chief. Patrick raves about how valuable these two young women are to the PD office, particularly with regard to sentencing advocacy in, in district court. As a team, they have altered the way they prepare their clients for sentencing, and they've had several very successful outcomes, especially in OWI cases. <clears throat> We'll, we'll move down, shift to the lower peninsula for a minute and talk about the Wexford Masaki Public Defender's Office. This regional PD office is located in Cadillac and the office got a new chief um, in January of 2021. He's pictured there in the pink shirt with the tie. Um, that's Bob Champion. And Bob went right to work assessing the needs of the office and quickly realized uh, they had outgrown their space and so um, found a new space right away, they've moved. And he also recognized the need for a social worker. And by way of a budget adjustment, he hired Shauna Shelton in the spring of 2021. And Shauna 
is the first MIDC funded social worker in Northern Michigan. And Shauna didn't waste any time either. She is a ball of energy. Uh, she went right to work on behalf of the PD office clients. She has helped several clients secure placements and rehab facilities. She's connected incarcerated clients with services while they're in jail. And she's had particular success with sentencing memoranda and convincing judges um, to incorporate holistic terms of probation in lieu of incarceration. During my visit there last fall, uh, one of the judges pulled me aside and told me how valuable she felt Shauna's memoranda are and how much she appreciates the additional insight. So the final system I'd like to highlight is Delta County. And here you see Emily DeSalvo. Uh, she is the Delta County Administrator. And she wanted to share a few words with you today about improvements to indigent defense in Delta County since implementation of the MIDC standards. And the video is a bit soft. So if you're appearing remote, you wanna make sure that your volume is up. Hi, my name is Emily DeSalvo. <clears throat> Um, Emily goes on to say that since Deputy Plurd's involvement, complaints from incarcerated clients have decreased and attorney accountability has increased. Um, this, <clears throat> whoops, wrong slide. This is Deputy Plurd. Um, she's just done an amazing job up there. I got to see her in action uh, when I visited Delta County last fall. And when she came on board, she went right to work. Um, there were problems, as Emily indicated, and some concerns with compliance. So um, Deputy Plurd uh, sent an introductory welcome letter to all of the attorneys and the courts that outlined all of her intentions um, to comply with MIDC standards and help ensure compliance. And she also created a log for attorneys to sign in at the jail to help track the standard two compliance, which was really an issue at the time. Most importantly, she created a communication request that uh, individuals who are lodged could send to her when they had difficulty communicating with their attorney. And Deputy Plurd made it very clear to them, please don't put the, the topic of discussion on the request. Just tell me you know, that you've tried to talk to your attorney and you haven't had success, and I will connect uh, you with that person. Eliza, 
uh, meticulously follows up on those requests and she tracks the timeliness of the responses by the attorneys. And as a result, there's been a huge improvement there. Um, sad for us, but happy for Liza. Uh, she is retiring. She doesn't look old enough to retire, um, but she's retiring in April. Um, a few, well, last week, actually, I received an email from Judge Parks, who is the, he is the 94th District uh, Court Judge there in Escanaba, and he asked me to share um, some thoughts with you about uh, the work that these two women have done to improve the criminal justice system in Delta County. So go ahead, as you're finishing your lunch, I'm just going to read his input. The last two years have been challenging for all courts. Dockets have been disrupted, orders have been difficult to enforce, and we've had to change how we do business. Things would have been much worse in Delta County without the leadership and resourcefulness of Deputy Liza Plurd and our County Administrator, Emily DeSalvo. We have an efficient and effective system for court-appointed attorneys thanks to Emily's guidance and oversight. When one of the attorneys was not doing his job, Emily took quick action to remedy the problem. The judges trust her and are comforted that the court appointment system is in her capable hands. Liza Plurd is an invaluable point of contact at the jail. She is a go-getter who embraced her MIDC responsibilities and earned the trust and respect of the judges, defense attorneys, and the inmates. Liza helps inmates understand issues related to their cases and court procedures, and also monitors the contacts between the court appointed attorneys and their clients. As a consequence, arraignments and preliminary examinations are conducted smoothly and efficiently. She has a reputation as a fair-minded corrections officer with a kind and compassionate heart, but can also be as tough as nails when she needs to be. She is irreplaceable and will be sorely missed when she retires in a few weeks. So just a few nice words Judge Parks asked me to share with, with the commission. And then this is the final fun fact. Uh, that is a picture of Judge Parks. He does know about this slide. He's, he gave me permission. Um, it's just a fun story out of Escanaba. Judge Parks is the individual who is responsible for getting the word youper added to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. He began writing to Merriam-Webster in 2002, and in 2013, um, he finally convinced them that the word was worthy of print. So the next time you're in Escanaba, um, I recommend that you stop by the, the Swedish Pantry, that restaurant that you see there in the photo. Um, they have authentic Swedish food. And you can also, while you're there, read about Judge Parks on the placemats. He is a local celebrity and the owner of that restaurant is extremely proud of him. It's a lovely elderly lady. I think it's been there for like 50 years. Um, the last time I was there for lunch, she sent me back to court with a carefully wrapped cookie and a friendly note for Judge Park. She told me that I looked trustworthy um, <laughs> to give it to him, which was nice. So um, that concludes my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And again, I just thank you so much. I apologize for the slide. I don't know what happened there, why I couldn't go full screen. But again, thank you very much for allowing me to do this today. I am Kelly McDaniel. I'm the regional manager for Wayne County, and I thank you for the opportunity to share some highlights from my region. Sound, we, we Wayne County is the most populous county in the state of Michigan. As of the 2020 census, it had just shy of 1.8 million people, and it is the 19th most populated county in the United States. The Wayne County court system is comprised of 25 courts, serving over 40 cities and municipalities, hearing over 300,000 cases a year before 90 judges, and with over 500 indigent defense attorneys on its rosters. The 25 courts in Wayne County consist of 3rd Circuit Court, the largest and busiest circuit court in the state, 36th District Court, the largest and busiest district court in the state, 19 other district courts, and 4 municipal courts. The county started an indigent defense 
office two years ago, and last year that office became an independent department within Wayne County. It is now known as the Indigent Defense Services Department, or IDSD. It is being managed by Robin Dillard, the director. Within that department, there's an Experts and Investigators program that started as a pilot project. It is an excellent resource for experts, investigators, and it is used by systems and attorneys throughout the state. Every year we're seeing an increase in the use of investigators and experts due to this program. Coming in fiscal year 23 are a couple exciting programs that we're in the works right now. One is the possibility of a social worker program for the assigned counsel. And two is the possibility of a second chair program for the attorneys on the assigned counsel list. As you are aware, fiscal year 23 plans and cost analysis are due April 26th. In the district and municipal courts, I've already had 21 planning meetings. We have 20 plans that are coordinated with the regional office and four plans that are not within the regional plan. For Wayne County, we have had seven planning meetings and have another one scheduled for tomorrow. We have worked through most, if not all, of the fiscal year 22 concerns, and I'm very happy to report that the process has been both cooperative and informative. Part of the planning process involves reviewing ancillary spending requests to ensure that they are both reasonable and directly related to the MIDC standards. From fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 22, the request for ancillary spending has been reduced by 58% or $2.5 million, and I have seen over 70,000 hours eliminated. While there are many great things happening in the Wayne County region, I would like to spotlight three areas today. First is the Regional MAC Office for District Courts. Second is the NDS Training Department. And third is the Misdemeanor Felony Defender's Office at 36 District Court. First up is the Regional MAC Office, which is located within the City of Dearborn. There are 20 district and municipal courts participating in this office. The approval of Standard 5, the upcoming Standard 6 through 8, and the interest in consolidating resources all led to the regionalization effort. Many of the courts were interested in the benefits of a regional plan, such as there would be no additional work placed on the funding units, There'd be a full-time attorney administrator at the regional office available every day during court hours. And there'd be resource consolidation, which would include maintaining attorney lists and on-call list, CLE requirements, and there'd be a checks and balance for attorney billings, caseloads, and CLE. The regional office assigns attorneys and approves invoices for all 20 courts. It manages the experts and investigator request and payments and has created a attorney database and manages CLE compliance. The MAC office hired its director, Teresa Patton, last October. And in just a few short months, the office is fully staffed. A website has been created. They are currently scheduling approximately 200 attorneys in 20 courts on a daily basis. They've created an attorney database. They review attorney invoices. That review has resulted in the identification of incorrect billing practices, and they have simplified the invoicing with the regional office invoice. Here's a picture of Teresa on the far left and her amazing staff. This office has by far exceeded everyone's expectations by creating an office, getting processes in place, getting processes implemented, and everyone so far has been absolutely thrilled with the progress made and look forward to the future with this office. Based on these amazing results, this is how I and most of the stakeholders they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis see Teresa and her staff. The second area I'd like to spotlight is the NDS training program, which is housed within the IDSD office in the county. The NDS training department 
is responsible for training all of the NDES staff and assigned counsel. The department manages all of the CAP seminars, provide additional brown bag trainings. They have a research attorney who identifies training topics and they manage attorney CLEs. The NDS training director is Kristen Lavoie, who is an absolute pleasure to work with. While participating in a Zoom NAPD conference one day, I noticed that Kristen was also in the same seminar that I was in. The speaker of the seminar was amazing, and I immediately emailed Kristen and said, I love this guy. Any chance we could work on trying to get him to Wayne County to provide a training for the attorneys? She responded back, agreed. And within three months, that same presenter was presenting for the Wayne County attorneys during a training seminar hosted by Kristen. Just some of the NDS training highlights of 2021. There were 14 brown bag seminars, 11 CAP seminars, there was a three-day DNA seminar, an eight-day NACDL grant conference regarding the use of experts and investigators, part one of Gideon's Promise training, and 22 internal NDS trainings. In 2021, there were 4,277 hours of training attended, which was up 168.5 hours from 2020. The average CLE hours per attorney was 19.7, which was up 6.5% from the previous year. Every two weeks, Kristen puts out an amazing NDS training newsletter. This is directly emailed to her list, as well as put on Facebook and the websites. It includes case law updates, upcoming Wayne County training, links to other trainings in the state, and practical application tips for the attorneys. And last but certainly not least, I would like to take a moment to discuss the amazing job that the Misdemeanor and Felony Defender's Office does in 36th District Court. The Misdemeanor and Felony Defenders have a contract to provide an attorney for all felony in custody arraignments, all misdemeanor in custody arraignments and cases, and they manage the attorneys for the weekend and holiday arraignment program. This small firm, managed by Joyce Reasonover, provided many examples for MIDC's best practices training last fall. An example of their innovative client-centered approach to representation include that they created YouTube videos for their clients to navigate the court's website to find information on their cases, and another YouTube video on how to enter and present yourself during Zoom court. This firm does not accept the status quo. Due to COVID, the number of detainees being release, released on tether increased dramatically, resulting in a delay on them being released from custody. Joyce and her attorneys requested of the judges that their clients be able to be released and report back for the tether, or they made arrangements with private tether companies so that their clients could leave custody as soon as possible. These attorneys go the extra mile for their clients. They have shelter phone numbers and contact people programmed into their phone. And if their client does not have a place to go, such as in a DV case with a no contact order, they will secure lodging for the, their client and make sure that they have an address available to give to the court. These attorneys also work to improve the entire system for the clients as well as the attorneys. They provide a very detailed contact sheet for the attorneys that will be appointed to the felony cases from the Third Circuit Court, and they have those available for those attorneys. That information includes email addresses, as well as if there's other family members that need to be contacted. Another example of the amazing work that the Misdemeanor Felony Defenders Group does is they've created a client handout sheet this sheet is given to all detainees in the Detroit Detention Center. On this sheet, it explains what an arraignment is, the different bond types, the next court appearances, how to look up a case, and how to access Zoom court. 
This is a great picture of an amazing group of hardworking, dedicated attorneys enjoying their end of year celebration last year. This concludes my presentation. I thank you very much for allowing me to share some of the highlights from the Wayne County region with you today. Awesome, thank you. I am thrilled to showcase the collaborative and innovative West Michigan region. We will meet the region, the public defender offices, investigators, social workers, interns, trainers, and professors, and provide you with examples of how resources are stretched by these amazing people. Also, you will get to know how we connect with our clients and communities. We are 14 counties, 15 systems, 23 courthouses, and 10 PD offices. Several systems have regionalized, Allegan and Van Buren, as well as Wyoming, Granville, Walker, and Kentwood. We search for ways to collaborate. All three systems in Kent County share investigators. The West Michigan Investigator Group would like to share a training budget. An office manager listserv is almost up and running and we utilize appeal partners. We strive to provide our clients with zealous client-centered representation. In FY19, there were three full-time social workers. For FY23, 21 are being requested. The use of social workers has led to better attorney-client relationships and a higher level of client participation, which culminates in more creative solutions that better serve our clients and the community. In FY19, there were seven full-time investigators. For FY23, 20 are being requested. The use of investigators has led to pretrial investigations, identification of additional witnesses, expert review of police reports, and the collection of evidence not identified in reports. Investigators help attorneys understand subject matter, which enables them to explain intricacies to their clients. The tracking down and interviewing of witnesses is constant and its importance for trial prep and negotiations is invaluable. Investigations by the defense increases legitimacy in the legal process and our clients faith in it. In order to continue to increase the use of social workers and investigators, our systems have developed a variety of referral forms in order to make the requesting process as user friendly and efficient as possible. The results are undeniable. In FY20, 1,300 cases used an investigator. For FY22, we are on track for over 3,000 cases to use an investigator. Ottawa's PD chief described West Michigan as follows, harnessing resources to have a strategic impact on individual clients and system at large. Meet our 10 PD chiefs. Seven of these chiefs did the heavy lift of creating a PD office. They have worked hard to understand and implement the MIDC standards. Many supportive and friendly relationships have evolved over the last three years. Meet our investigators. These are some of the dedicated professionals currently serving West Michigan. Because of their expertise and perseverance, there are many success stories. Today, we will highlight four of these successes. First case, client was charged with a felony of criminal sexual conduct. Investigators were able to find evidence that the complainant texted about the CSC allegations. These text messages revealed a scheme to help the biological mom get her child back. Turns out the CSC allegation was false. Second case, Client was charged with the misdemeanor domestic violence. Prosecutor had the 911 call for this alleged DV incident. The defender's office investigator learned that the complainant had made other 911 calls alleging DV. In the end, over 50 911 calls were pulled. Allegations were recanted. Charges were dismissed. The third case is a misdemeanor case with a large restitution request. The victim fabricated many requests, including the purchase of an emotional support animal. 
She provided an email stating that she had purchased the dog for $1,500. Turned out the person who sent her the email was her friend and this friend had made up the expense. The client was facing thousands of dollars in restitution. Ultimately, zero dollars were ordered. Without the investigator, the client would have been tied down for years trying to pay that restitution. And for the final success story that we will share today, this case involves countless hours of investigation, motions, and appeals. To make a long story short, the investigative team discovered the police raided the wrong house. By discovering the address on the search warrant was incorrect. All felony charges were dismissed. Because of the investigators, this client was not separated from her children, family, or community. Approximately a year ago, the West Michigan Investigator Group was created. A listserv was made and Zoom meetings were held. These meetings are attended by chiefs, deputy chiefs, and investigators from all 10 PD offices. The last two meetings were at the Allegan PD office. This group has developed several goals. They wish to develop trainings. In FY23, they would like to hold four regional conferences and one statewide conference. They want to find ways to help level the playing field. For example, the definition of criminal justice worker does not extend to public defender investigators. Therefore, there are databases and trainings that our investigators are excluded from. Meet our social workers. Pictured are some of the compassionate social workers that serve West Michigan. They collaborate all of the time. They work with the court, PD office staff, defense attorneys, each other, and anyone who inquires. They are always eager to listen, brainstorm, and lend a helping hand. Prior to MIDC funding, Muskegon had a PD office. This office collaborated with Bronx Defenders and brought aboard a social work intern and created a thriving intern program. Through networking, Muskegon assists other offices looking to hire social workers. Pictured are a few of their interns turned full-time Defender Office social workers. We are very fortunate to have this training and hiring pipeline. Pictured is the last internship day for Allegan Van Buren's law school intern. This internship was during the height of the pandemic and done by Zoom. The final day was a mock trial, which the team prepared for during the internship. And I was lucky enough to participate as a juror. Fun was had by all. <laughs> Last week, I had the privilege to meet Ottawa's summer law student intern. He studies in Wisconsin and is from Ottawa County. He is thrilled to be part of Ottawa's PD office for the summer. Barian had an intern throughout the last two years. She just passed the bar and is now a full-blown Barian County public defender. One goal for FY23 is for offices to grow their internship programs. A few months ago, I surveyed West Michigan offices and inquired what they hope to achieve from their internship programs. They hope to create a hiring pipeline, increase goodwill, dispel myths about public defense, and have an additional member of the team. Additionally, they said these passionate interns bring an amazing vibe and enthusiasm to the office. Meet our trainers and professors. Jennifer Peck, Don Trail, and Denise Lane would, led workshops at our 2022 MIDC Leadership Conference. Walter Downs, Larry Lewis, and Amanda Meter teach classes at local colleges. Amanda and Alyssa led a workshop at the conference for the Michigan Association for Treatment Court Professionals. Muskegon's Amanda Meter hosted a free statewide three-day social work training with special guests Alyssa from Ottawa and Chad from Allegan. It was a nuts and bolts training with plenty of time to brainstorm, collaborate, and create lasting friendships. Training never ends in West Michigan. Systems constantly look for opportunities and resources within its own system to provide trainings to increase their knowledge about important topics.
We contribute to the national indigent defense community by participating in research studies. Barry County is one of two locations in the entire United States to participate in a study regarding the cost benefit of counsel at first appearance. One of the ways we connect with our communities is through partnerships. Kalamazoo Defenders Village embraces holistic representation and includes various service partners. Several of these providers have on-site offices in order to make it easier for their clients to access their services. The village is funded with community grants. By using volunteers and donations, Many PD offices have held expungement clinics. These expungement clinics help pave the way for brighter futures for our fellow citizens. Several of our offices partnered with Safe and Just Michigan and West Michigan Works. These clinics delivered a great service by helping people determine their eligibility to set aside convictions, complete the necessary petitions, notarize documents, and complete fingerprints in one convenient setting. By participating in our communities, we learn their needs. Through collaboration, innovation, donations, and volunteers, we attempt to meet these needs. We provide public service announcements, hygiene products, and hold community meetings. Several offices have created clothing closets, and their clients appreciate these donations, whether it's they need clothes for court or a job interview or just life in general. We hope to meet their needs. Through volunteer hours and donation dollars, Barian and Calhoun have found meaningful ways to engage with the youth in their community. In Gideon versus Wainwright, the Supreme Court held that states are required under the Sixth Amendment to provide counsel to indigent defendants in criminal cases. In West Michigan, we believe it is important to honor Gideon and this fundamental right by doing our best and looking for opportunities to do more. Over time, we will see the impact of the increased resources and intensity in our region and identifiable and measurable ways, such as reduced recidivism and incarceration. And to the MIDC Commission, thank you. We could not do this without you. South Central Michigan, and I am so proud today to be able to talk to you all about the concept of zealous representation in the South Central region. As a way to illustrate this concept, I will be sharing several examples of the outstanding work being done by the defenders here in this region. And I'd like to start with some simple inspiration. As you all probably know, Russ Church is now retired, but was the chief public defender in Ingham County. We try cases was his simple but very effective mantra. We try cases isn't only about trials, rather it is a powerful mindset, thinking strategically about every case as if it were going to trial. I will explore this concept in my presentation, give some real life examples from my region. I wanna focus on the actual work being done on a day-to-day -day basis by the talented individuals in these systems. So what does it mean to try cases? Well, we start with representation at arraignment. We move into analyzing discovery and the evidence in the case, holding preliminary exams when it is in the best interest of our client and our client's desire to do so. Um, motion practice, litigating motions and holding contested hearings, skillful negotiation of plea bargains, holding jury and bench trials, sentencing mitigation, utilizing experts, investigators, and social workers. And these resources, these individuals are incredibly powerful tools that we are able to use throughout the entire process. They're essentially woven into many different parts of this, of this process of holding a case. And finally, probably most importantly, advising our clients, walking them through every step of the way. So meaningful representation begin, beginning at arraignment um, I'd like to focus on a couple systems, Clinton, Gratiot, and Shiawassee counties. Um, they, they do what I kind of refer to as a waiver, waiver of the formal arraignment process. So the arraignments in these counties 
Um, and waiver of arraignment just simply means waiving the formal arraignment proceeding, that first hearing. The defendants will arrive in person, they check in with the court clerk who refers them to defense counsel. The clients then have private consultations with the attorney. The attorney reviews the charges, advises of their rights, completes the intake paperwork. And unless they're charged with a felony or are charged with a case that requires bond conditions, clients are free to leave the court without appearing in front of the judge. This makes the process more informal, reduces the time clients must spend in court, reduces client anxiety, and it's just a more overall efficient process for our clients. <clears throat> the option to waive the formal arraignment proceeding was once a luxury, really, made, that was enjoyed by those with retained counsel, but now it is available to many indigent clients. And I would note this practice is not unique to these systems, but I did want to highlight it as an example of meaning, re meaningful representation at the outset of the case. So next, what, how else are we trying cases? Well, we're also analyzing discovery, which results in dismissals. Um, Livingston County, I have an example there. They had a client charged with domestic violence against his girlfriend. The gas station attendant called the police and said that the client had abused his girlfriend by picking her up and slamming her head into the door of the store. After watching the store video, defense counsel saw that the client picked up his girlfriend like he would a bride and walked her out of the store. The two of them were laughing and joking around. The defense showed this to the prosecutor and the case was dismissed. And in Eaton County, there was a client that was charged with leaving the scene of an accident. The defense used Facebook, a list of alibi witnesses and review of the body cam video where the officer did not actually ask for the driver's ID to show the prosecutor that the driver whom the officer had pulled over had actually given the officers a fake name and the driver was the client's sister, case dismissed. So holding preliminary exams, another area that we try cases, and this can result in bind overs being denied for lack of probable cause. So an example of this is Livingston County. They had a client that was a real estate agent and charged with larceny in a building for allegedly stealing items that were in a home they gained access to as an agent than selling these items to a pawn shop. The investigator reviewed the evidence, compared the list of items alleged, alleged stolen and the list of items a client had sold to a pawn shop and noted that they were in fact not the same items. Based on this and some other factors, the court refused to bind the case over to circuit court, case dismissed. In Eaton County, they had a client charged with possession of meth. The police officers uh, that were involved saw a car parked at a 24-7 self-storage unit and for some reason became suspicious and began checking all of the units until they came upon one that was unlocked. With their guns drawn, they entered the unit and discovered the client sleeping in the unit. Officers performed a search and discovered meth. A preliminary exam, the defense cross-examined the officers to reveal they had no probable cause to enter the premises. The storage unit had been lawfully rented by the client. At the judge's request, the defense briefed the issue for a motion to dismiss, suppress, which was argued at a later hearing and granted by the judge. Case dismissed. We also try cases through motion practice and holding contested hearings, including motions to suppress, motions to dismiss. Um, Shiawasi had an example where they had a client charged with a hit and run vehicle accident. The client stated he was at work at the time of the accident. The investigator investigator gathered alibi evidence, including time cards and statements from the client's boss and the office secretary as proof that he was at work. Defense filed a motion to dismiss and the prosecutor dismissed the case before the hearing. In Ingham County, with the help of their very talented paralegal team, the defense filed a motion to suppress in a CCW case, a concealed carry weapons case, based on Fourth Amendment grounds from an unlawful police search of client's vehicle. Rather than fighting this in court, the prosecutor dismissed the case. And we also try cases through contested hearings. So Ingham County had an example um, of restitution hearing in a dog bite case. The victim had alleged extensive damages that were unrelated to the incident. During the hearing, the defense successfully contested these unrelated damages and ultimately stipulated to a reasonable amount of restitution, saving her client about $500 in damages. We also try cases through utilizing our experts, our investigators, and our social workers, which can result in acquittals, dismissals, and favorable plea agreements. So Ingham County is a great example. 
With the help of investigators and the DNA expert, the defense was able to get a not guilty verdict for his client at jury trial, who was charged with criminal sexual assault. The only evidence was that of DNA found on the complaining witness. Thanks to the office having funds available to hire an expert, the defense was able to explain the science of transfer DNA and show the jury that the DNA found on the complaining witness likely came from her sleeping on the guest mattress in the client's home and using shared blankets. Without the ability to hire such an expert, the client would likely have spent years in prison for a crime he was found not guilty of. In Shiawassee County, the, they had a client that was charged with fleeing and eluding and felonious assault. The investigator assisted the defense with reconstructing the crime scene, revealing an incomplete investigation by the police. Defense, the defense used video, witness interviews, and bullet trajectory to show that the officer fired shots at the client without proper justification, and the client did not commit an assault against the officer. The felonious assault charge was dismissed, and the defense was able to get a very favorable deal on the fleeing and eluding charge. And we also try cases by skillful plea negotiations and sentencing mitigation, which sometimes results in probation and treatment alternatives or reducing incarceration. So Livingston, a very simple example, they had two young clients who were both charged with operating while intoxicated second offense, which is a one year misdemeanor. Defense counsel got both into drug court and it appears they are still in the program and have remained sober. This prevented them from going to jail and they both will have drug court licenses instead of losing their ability to drive. And in Eaton County, they had a client charged with criminal sexual conduct in the second degree involving a minor. The first or former attorney negotiated a 36 month sentence. Client then went uh, to the public defender office and he also was referred to the public defender social worker who discovered extensive childhood abuse suffered by the client in addition to some significant addiction issues. The defense was able to obtain a plea offer and sentence of 10 months jail, followed by probation as a result of the social worker's report and the client's own involvement in recovery groups. And finally, we try cases with trials. And exercising the right to trial, we have results, we have acquittal results. I have a couple examples here. Ingham County had a client charged with child abuse. The defense attorney successfully argued to the jury that discipline is not abuse. The jury agreed and client was acquitted. Livingston County, they had a client charged with aggravated domestic violence and the jury acquitted. And this is very interesting. Shiawassee County, um, they routinely use their in-house investigator to evaluate police testimony real time during trials. With the investigator's help during a line of questioning, the defense was able to get the officer in charge to admit in a jury trial that he arrested the wrong man. Client was acquitted. Trial strategy includes all the things I've talked about thus far. Um, as we've seen in the examples, setting cases for trial and maintaining the mindset that we try cases results in acquittals, dismissals, and great plea deals. These are some excellent results and it's all due to the hard work of these dedicated attorneys they're great support staff, great investigators, great experts, great social workers, and the significant funding and invaluable resources granted by the MIDC. These stories I presented are just a tiny fraction, I mean a small fraction of the successes happening on a daily basis. Um, it was really a challenge to reduce this down to about 10, 12 minutes. Um, I had a lot, a lot of examples to share. And finally, um, I'd like to end with, this is my favorite quote of all time. It's Maya Angelou, and she says, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And like I've got in my notes here, at first blush, this may not seem relevant to what we do, but when we think about client-centered representation, this sentiment is actually very relevant. When we try cases, we bring dignity and grace to the process for our clients. Our clients will certainly not remember all that we say and all that we do, but they will always remember how we made them feel during the process. The zealous representation is about advocating for our clients, informing, advising them along the way, acting in their best interest. All the while, we should also seek to maintain respectful relationships with judges, prosecutors, court staff, and other community stakeholders in the process. Zealous representation occurs both in court and out of court. We try cases every step of the way so that our clients have the best opportunity 
for justice and fairness. Thank you all very much for your time. Uh, hi, everybody. Most of you know me. A couple of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet. Um, I am Barb Klemaszewski, and I'm the regional manager for Mid Michigan. Go ahead, Susan. Um, next, next slide. There we go. This is my region. I call it the massive middle. Uh, it's 23 counties. It has a pretty big cross section of kinds of. Uh, jurisdictions and the kinds of systems that they use to meet our standards. The total funding for the region for FY22 is just close to $20 million, just under $20 million. Um, and it covers a whole wide variety of ways to go about doing our job. It also has a lot of, go ahead Susan, next, next slide, a lot of uh, beautiful things. I, it goes from lake to lake. On the left is the Lake in Ludington on the right is Tawas. And so I get to see the Great Lakes when I travel around my region. Next slide. This is Baldwin, Michigan, where we have the beautiful trout sculpture. This is a rainbow trout. Uh, there's not a lot in Baldwin except a trout sculpture and a courthouse. There's a few other things, but not much. Uh, so it's, uh, that, that's an example of an interesting diverse community because it's racially diverse but also very rural and also the poorest county in the state of Michigan, Lake County. Next slide, Susan. We also have the dueling Paul Bunyans in my region. On the left is Paul Bunyan in Oscoda uh, County. On the right is Paul Bunyan in uh, Ossinique. And Asinique, Paul Bunyan has the advantage of having bathed the blue ox, so I vote for the Asinique, Paul Bunyan. Um, but I've got two Paul Bunyans, so you can't, can't deny that I'm lucky in that regard. Next slide. This is how my, county, my counties break down in terms of how they meet our systems. We have um, a multi-county part-time managed assigned council system in uh, a pretty big percentage. We have a single county part-time managed assigned council system. We have full-time county employee managed assigned council. In uh, although that's a small number, uh, it, is, it is a pretty effective system for those that use it. I have a regional managed assigned council system uh, in the biggest chunk of my counties. I have county, uh, by that county I mean county department public defender offices. I have those in Isabella and in Bay. And then I have vendor, nonprofit vendor public defender offices uh, in Alpena, Montmorency and in Saginaw. This just goes to speak to that local control issue that uh, Commissioner Shea spoke about. Each county really has designed something that suits them. Um, and they've really had to stretch in a lot of ways to make anything work because their systems tend to be small. And many of these counties have no county administration at all, which is a struggle in terms of a lot of our functions, uh, particularly when it comes to reporting and budget management. Next slide. This is an example of one of the Midland, uh, this of one of the full-time employee managed assigned council systems. Uh, it's Midland, and we have this in Midland. We have it in Tuscola. We have it in Sanilac. That person in each of those counties has the primary uh, responsibility for council at first appearance, also for assigning all attorneys, reviewing all the bills, uh, and the Midland uh, Mac prepared uh, uh, this information showing what he feels they've accomplished by setting it up. This, this is the first year that they have functioned in this way. They previously had a non-employee managed design council system. They appear to be pretty pleased with having made this change uh, and they feel like they've really accomplished our standards a lot more effectively by doing it this way. Next slide. Uh, the, he does uh, district court arraignments averaging 115 a month, circuit court arraignments 25 a month, violation of probations 10 a month, um, and 
he often has to have like coverage from another attorney on the panel in order to be able to accomplish these arraignments because they're operating in a couple of courts at the same time. Um, but it, it, he has been able to get all of that coverage done quite successfully and everything's moving along uh, a lot better, I think, under the Employee Mac system. Next slide. Uh, this is the Midland County Courthouse. The Mac states he's trying to work on getting people to use um, the private investigators more, but he's pretty proud that they have begun to use experts more, and in particular that sometimes the retained counsel is uh, coming on behalf of an indigent defendant whose families have retained them to, ha to get help with expert witnesses, and that's been a big accomplishment for uh, Midland, and it's making that system work more smoothly as well. Next slide. Uh, this is a, we have a big problem with attorney shortage to piggyback on the presentation that Mike just gave you. And I've brought a couple of examples here to talk about uh, what that really means. This region is, uh, this is one circuit. Ascota, Alcona, Iasco, Aranac is one circuit. And to go back to that discussion about the use of Zoom, the circuit court judge that sits in these I recently had a conversation with me and he was complaining because he really hates Zoom. And he hates it in particular when there are out-of-town attorneys because he just feels like the whole thing doesn't work very well. And I encouraged him a lot to work more with that because um, because of the attorney shortage. And I, I pointed out to him exactly what that was going to mean and I'm going to show you a little bit more about that in a moment. After I had that conversation with him, I met with him a couple of weeks later and he said he couldn't quit thinking about that conversation we had and he's really changed his mind about this and is determined to work more about enhancing his zoom operations because he said to me i realized that in one day i could have no attorneys at all next slide uh, these are the four courthouses uh, that he works in and in some of them the coverage is better than in others um, but the problem is that in this circuit, there are so few attorneys. Uh, this, this is part of the, a circuit that when I met with Mike and several of the Macs in this area, they were describing a phenomenon where the general population is going down, the attorney population is going down, the caseload is going up, and the seriousness of the charges is going up, because the economy is bad and poverty generates those kinds of problems. So it's kind of like icebergs crashing here. We've got cases up, serious cases, particularly meth cases, multi-defendant cases. We don't have the attorneys to handle them. Next slide. This is the way this breaks down. The blue shows local attorneys and the uh, orange shows attorneys that travel to work in those counties. Now, uh, th this is a, a significant change in most of these places from when we started in 2019. Um, the, the, uh, the breakdown is that, it, like, IOSCO has five attorneys. When we started in 2019, it was the same number, but only two of those are now local attorneys and three travel from other counties. And one of those only does it on special assignment, not on a normal rotation. Aranac County has three attorneys active. When we started in 2019, they had seven active attorneys. And um, all but two were local. And now we, they have three attorneys active. Only one is local. Uh, and at any time, those ones that are not local could just decide that this is too much driving for them because it's a lot of driving. And the third one is thinking about running for public office that would disqualify him. He's the only local attorney remaining in Aranac County. And he's thinking about leaving the panel because he's going to run for an office that would disqualify him from taking cases. So Aranac County is one of the counties that this judge covers. And he, after we had this conversation, he really got to thinking about how important it was that he change his mind about the Zoom thing. And he has done so. But it just sort of underscores the critical shortages that we're really looking at. Alcona has three active attorneys. They had six active attorneys in 19, uh, and only uh, two of those attorneys are local, and they have no capital qualified attorneys in Alcona County. The only one that comes in um, is from Alpena County, 
uh, and he's, he covers any capital cases that occur in that county. Uh, recently, there's been a two-defendant capital case there, and we had to bring in another out-of-town attorney in order to cover that. Uh, and that's going to be a pretty expensive process to do that, but there's really no other option available there. Uh, Oscoda has three active attorneys. They had four in 2019, but only one of those three attorneys now is local, and um, two of them uh, are talking about retirement. So I, I'm not really sure what we're going to do in that county, but that's where, that's where we're at. This just shows you that we've got a lot of sort of, si they, they look like silos. They're silos. These attorneys are sort of isolated, and they, they, there's not a lot of cooperation even on things like scheduling, even in a situation like this where they're all part of the same circuit. Next slide. This is a bit of a contrast, uh, it, although it also demonstrates the attorney shortage situation. This is the eight county region um, that it was really the pioneering regionalization project in my region. And these eight counties independently all hired the same manager, that being Karen Moore, and she has done a really good job of demonstrating how regionalization really can make this situation less of a burden than it was. Uh, these uh, only two of these counties operate under one contract that's Claire and Gladwin other than that each of these counties individually contracts with Karen and with her firm she has a firm that operates the managed assigned council system in all eight of these counties so she handles all the attorneys in all eight counties in terms of their billing in terms of their qualifications in terms of their use of experts and investigators and in terms of assignment of cases She's also pioneered a second chair program to try to raise the qualifications of some of these attorneys that have less experience or less capital experience. And the result of that is that even though her attorney numbers have dropped, uh, she's done a more effective job of obtaining coverage for those attorneys. Um, next slide, please. Um, what we have here, is, these, are the, these are the eight counties that um, are involved in her program and she um, has been able to with fewer attorneys get an improvement in being able to get the coverage on it on a sort of more immediate basis uh, next slide please uh, th this shows you the traveling attorneys again in brown the local attorneys in blue there are there there's been some reduction in the local attorneys in these eight counties but not quite as drastic as in the four county circuit um, but she's able to get these traveling attorneys uh, in amongst all the eight counties even though they're not in the same circuit I mean they're they're paired up in circuits but they're not all in the same circuit but she's able to get people from within this eight county group and also some of them come in from as far away as Grand Rapids and Muskegon which is not within this eight county region but they do come in some of them come in again to handle arraignments by zoom we have um, a lot of of that kind of coverage in this region we also have people that are capital qualified that come in from out of county so she's able to get this coverage by just sort of thinking in a more regional way and it, it's it I think is really a demonstration of how regionalization can um, at least stop the bleeding and to a certain extent in terms of the coverage of the uh, attorneys in these places that don't have any lake for example has only one local attorney uh, in that county and the rest is is traveling and, and it, it doesn't look like that on this chart because the local attorney is able to uh, cover so much of what's going on there but we still have just a, a more effective system here because the whole thing is being approached in a regional way next slide um, well, let me back up just one second before we go to the Sagna PD office. I just wanted to indicate, too, that we have in the thumb um, a, a little bit more about the attorney shortage situation in the thumb. Uh, Huron pretty much is still covering. Uh, they've got a little bit of a drop, but they're still covering locally. But Tuscola has had such an attorney shortage, they only have one local attorney left, um, and they are now considering a transition to a public defender office. Uh, Sanilac County uh, has had a huge drop in the number of people on their panel. Um, they are uh, they are uh, adding a, a social worker there. It's an innovative 
uh, idea. They are having a social worker work with their MAC panel. They don't have a PD office, but they're still trying to get the social worker in, in FY23. Um, and because the MAC here reviews all the reports because he's covering the arraignments, uh, the attorneys there feel a lot more sense of community. They feel a lot more connected. They feel more like they're getting um, information from one another about things that can help them in terms of both their motion practice and their trial practice. Um, they don't have a lot of trials, but they have won 70% of their jury trials and 100% of their felony trials. Um, Isabella County has a PD office that's a county department. They've done a really great job of setting up a very fine operation in their PD office. But um, the first thing that the uh, uh, Isabella PD reported is that they're having an attorney shortage. Not to fill their PD slots, they've been fairly successful at that, but their managed assigned counsel panel that covers their conflicts and overflows has had a very big drop. There's a lot of pressures on that panel in terms of covering juvenile cases and they've just had a really difficult time adding new people to that panel so they've got a big problem there. Um, it, recently in Roscommon and Ogama, uh, which both operate under the same managed assign council one attorney was ill and two attorneys were on vacation and there it, it was a massive crisis there was a tremendous amount of scrambling to cover. Uh, these attorneys have now sworn that they will coordinate their vacations, but they can't yet figure out how to coordinate their heart attacks. So let's move to Saginaw. Saginaw is a system that is an urban, primarily urban environment. Just came out this past couple of days with the new crime statistics. They're number one in Michigan in terms of uh, increase in crime rates. Now that has something to do with charging policies, but nevertheless, that's what these folks are dealing with. Uh, you're going to see a little bit in terms of their grant that they're having also some transition issues with the court management uh, that has caused some difficulty in gathering statistics. But their PD office and their managed assigned counsel office work hand in hand and each of them covers half of the cases. Uh, next slide. This is the this is the PD and Mac. We have first uh, Ebony Ellis. She's the managed assigned counsel person in Saginaw. Then we have Demond Tibbs, who's the deputy uh, chief of the PD office. Amy Med, who's the office manager, and Steve Fenner, who is the chief. Um, these folks operate the defense system in Saginaw. It's a huge task, and they've been doing an extremely good job. This is where I did mo much of my practice when I, I practiced. My office was in Saginaw for 37 years. So I got to tell you, this has been a big change to have people like this who are pioneering and really uh, willing to pitch in and handle uh, with tremendous skill uh, this transition to doing a different kind of approach to defense. Um, the, the PD office has won all their trials except one. Um, most of those trials are cases that in the past would have been pled. Uh, they have had, they're very proud of their diverse staff. They have very diverse staff in the PD office uh, that reflects the community. They have a social worker who's especially helpful in dealing with the substance abuse cases and mental health cases in Saginaw. Um, and they have uh, hooked up with Saginaw Valley State University, so they have interns from the social work program there that also works with the staff. They're also hosting me today because they have a good, strong internet connection, and I don't, so I'm here at their office today. Um, they have um, some issues with retention of staff, like all the PD offices do. The PD offices all around the state are kind of going around poaching each other, and that's happening to Saginaw as well. Um, they have been educating their community about the role of the Public Defender Office and getting a lot of positive reaction, but also this is a big change for uh, the community in Saginaw to just recognize the PD Office as being a force here. They've pioneered uh, a lot of use of technology. They're encouraging more of that in the future. Um, and they are uh, moving to more holistic defense model. Uh, and they intend to continue moving in that direction further. And I think for a community like Saginaw, that's going to be a big help. 
Um, they, so they are trying to increase their tech. They are trying to keep better track of their accomplishments so that they can continue to build their community ties. Um, and they um, are trying to also think of some good ways and develop some good ways to take care of their staff so that they've got uh, a strong a strong staff that is less burned out. They're trying to figure out ways to reduce burnout, improve the mental health of their staff, and expand their social worker program. So Saginaw is definitely uh, still building their program, but they're doing a really great job of doing so. Next slide. Um, I want to finish here with um, Alpina and Montmorency. Alpina was in the race to the bottom study. Uh, for those of you that haven't looked at that, it's a good thing to look at. It's sort of the pioneering foundational document of the MIDC. It was an analysis of how defense services were being delivered around the state of Michigan before MIDC was created. And Alpena was one of the counties that was studied and it didn't do well in the race to the bottom study because it wasn't doing well in delivering those services. They now have a public defender office that combines Alpena and Montmorency County, Montmorency County being a county that has zero local attorneys. And the um, office covers both of those counties and they have established uh, for the very first time a space in Montmorency County for attorneys to meet with their clients and to, uh, and it's a small office, it's a satellite office of their primary which is in Alpena. And uh, in the past, they just met people at the courthouse, mostly in the hallway, and mostly just before court. Now they have uh, the opportunity to meet with their clients in a private setting uh, so that they can do a much better job of, of preparing for their cases. Um, next slide. They get a lot of good press in, in the Alpena paper because they have a reporter that's very interested. So that this was an interview that was done after they had done their first year of holistic defense. Uh, next slide. And this um, is an editorial, which is sort of typical. The Alpena News has editorially supported the establishment of both the original system, which was a managed assigned counsel system, but because of attorney shortage, they decided to go with the public defender system, which has been more successful for them. Um, there's been very big support from the newspaper and from the rest of the community. Uh, they have started doing novel things like getting the discovery, which has not been the practice in the past. Now they get the discovery. The prosecutor was not real happy about this. She complained, you know, the public defenders never used to ask for all that stuff. So now they're asking for that stuff. They are, get, they are filing motions. They, uh, for example, filed recently a motion to suppress um, based on the video from the Michigan State Police. And uh, the prosecutor dismissed the case before the motion was argued. They took a look at the motion in the brief and decided the case could not be successfully pursued. They got a statement suppressed recently based on unmirandized statements to the police. They run prelims on the majority of their cases unless they have a plea deal in place. Um, they've had multiple jury trial acquittals. They've had um, two multiple felony cases that that came out as misdemeanor verdicts. They had one hung jury in a capital case. You can do the next slide, please. Uh, which now they're challenging the mistrial as being, uh, that the, the argument is that this should result in a dismissal of the case. Um, I don't know where that case is going to go right now. It's in the Court of Appeals at the moment. They're doing an interlocutory appeal, which is also a first for this office. And most importantly, they've really been establishing some great community ties, partly because of this great support from the local newspaper. But the deputy in that office was invited to speak to the League of Women Voters panel. And during the course of that panel discussion, their PD office was described as being superheroes. And I have to agree. I think they are superheroes. They are really plowing some new ground in Alpena and Montmorency counties. They've had... Um, the local reporter that's been writing these articles, she was actually moved deeply when she saw an investigator get on the stand during this case that's referred to in this article because she had never seen an investigator testify on behalf of the defendant. She's been covering the courts for quite a few years. She had never seen that happen before, and it, it was such a stunning event for her that she was really quite moved by the whole thing. 
Uh, they are now also working with Community Corrections to establish a pretrial supervision project um, so that their clients can get out on bond and be successfully supervised uh, rather than going, uh, staying in jail because the judge is concerned about what's going to happen to them um, in the, in the pretrial period. So this is a what I consider a tremendous success story to go from race to the bottom to having this very dynamic uh, p public defender office. They have a small managed assigned counsel overflow panel um, that ha that is experiencing attorney shortage. So we're back to the attorney shortage question. Um, so it and this year they've just hired in the last couple of weeks um, at the start of the fiscal year uh, a social worker. And since one of the main problems they have are drug cases and probably secondarily from that mental health situations, um, the social worker I think is going to be a big help in making this a more successful uh, attempt even than it has been in the past. So that's kind of a, a sampling of my region. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Um, it's a it's a wide ranging region and um, We've had pretty much a little bit of everything. So I am so happy to be able to talk with you today about one of my favorite topics, which of course is the Lapeer, Macomb, Oakland, and St. Clair region, uh, or as I like to call it, S region. So the Lomos region is located in the southeastern part of Michigan, uh, where the Little Heart is on the map. It's made up of four counties with nine district courts and 17 third class district courts. We also have more than 500 attorneys serving indigent clients. Now let's meet the Lomos regional team. So that's just a little quick snapshot of who we are and where we are. And now I'd like to talk about a couple of uh, points of pride. First, we have no cap on CLE. Um, as was mentioned a little bit before, uh, Oakland County contracts with the Oakland County Bar Association on behalf of itself and the third class district courts in its jurisdiction. Any attorney on an Oakland County list is able to take as many credits as the Oakland County Bar Association offers. Um, Macomb County contracts with the Criminal Defense Attorneys of Michigan on its behalf, on behalf of the attorneys uh, in the third class district courts in the county, as well as the attorneys in Lapeer and St. Clair County. Um, I think there was a comment earlier that the counties require their attorneys to just take CLE from their providers. And I think that might have been true very early in the MIDC program, but, but it is not true today. And um, a, attorneys are able to, to take CLE outside of their uh, provider, but the funding units are not able to pay for that CLE if there is a charge. Um, and I should also say that uh, the attorneys under the Macomb plan are able to take any CDM course that they want, except for trial college. Basically, another thing that we're trying to accomplish with, without having caps on CLE is creating a culture of education. And I know that you're not supposed to have slides which are just a bunch of text, but I wanted to give a voice to some people from our region. And um, so I will go ahead and, and read a couple of these of these slides that, that appear like this. This quote is from uh, Mac Tanya Grillo, who manages the um, assigned council systems in the East Point and Southfield area. Uh, Tanya says, 
By allowing attorneys to have unlimited CLE opportunities, we encourage them as, to learn as much as they possibly can to benefit their clients. Classes tend to encourage an open dialogue to help attorneys learn techniques and skill sets that are relevant to their everyday practices. It's not just about learning about ballistics or blood spatter or autopsies. It's about the things that matter the most to our clients, especially in district court. Similarly, Macomb County Chief Public Defender Tom Tomko says, providing an unlimited number of CLE hours allows attorneys to sharpen their skills as, as needs arise. From evidence boot camp to sentencing issues, to keeping up with DNA testing techniques, Unlimited CLE hours and recorded trainings help free attorneys from both time constraints and financial constraints as they look to improve their skills and better represent clients. So what does unlimited CLE really look like? Well, I got a report in November from the Oakland County Bar Association about you know, where attorneys were in completing their requirements. Um, 51 attorneys on this report had completed more than 12 hours of CLE. An additional nine attorneys had completed at least 20 hours of CLE. An additional two attorneys had completed at least 30 hours of CLE. And one attorney named Tina Saxon had completed 49.75 hours of CLE. <laughs> so I called Tina <laughs> and I said, Tina, why did you take so much CLE? And looking at her transcript, it looks like she took 45 hours of the burn jag training. She also took from the OCBA uh, a class on HIDA, a class on immigration, one on hearsay, and one focusing on representing clients with mental illness. And Tina told me that when she was in law school, she did not intend to go into criminal defense. She thought she would be practicing employment law. And so she wanted to um take classes that would help her improve her skills and help her become an excellent defender tina reported that she had her first jury trial in october it was a felonious assault case her client was a security guard who also had um, a license to carry a concealed weapon and as a result of the charges he was fired and he lost his license well thanks in large part, according to Tina, to the great training that she received through the Burn JAG program, her client was acquitted, and now he's working on rebuilding his life. We also are very excited in our region about district to circuit court appeals. Um, these appeals were, were basically not impossible, but, but almost non-existent before the MIDC program. Here's a quote from Pete Mena, who you heard from earlier today from Oakland County. He's the chief attorney for the Indigent Defense Office. Pete says, district to circuit appeals have long been an enigma, difficult for clients to pursue and subject to many internal barriers that can arise when the court is managing the appointment process. Standard five has given us the ability to break down those barriers and manage these appeals in a centralized way. Even though it is a small sample size, the tangible results we have seen in our system have made a difference. And we hope to bring even more resources to bear in the future to improve outcomes for our clients. So let's take a look at this order from the Court of Appeals. It's in the People uh, versus Simpson case. Mr. Simpson was originally charged in the Rochester District Court with driving while license suspended and improper load or towing. He pleaded guilty to not having an operator's license on his person and responsible to impeding traffic. On March 10, 2022, the district court ordered him to pay $580 and serve 60 days in jail. Uh, four days later, the Oakland Indigent Defense, Indigent Defense Office had appointed appellate counsel, and within two days, that attorney was actively pursuing Mr. Simpson's release. Um, as this order shows, the Court of Appeals ordered that Mr. Simpson be immediately released on his uh, personal recognizance, on a, on a personal recognizance bond pending appeal. So these district to circuit court appeals are very important, and I'd like to give a special 
shout out to Sato, who this year had a, uh, a special CLE on District of Circuit Court Appeals with a focus on Oakland Macomb and Macomb County. I'd also like to point out an exciting development in Oakland County. Um, this memo shows that the circuit court has stopped collecting attorney fee reimbursements. Um, the county has also eliminated attorney fee reimbursements as a revenue line in the budget for the district and circuit courts. So I know the Sixth Amendment Center report talked a little bit about um, attorney fee reimbursements having a chilling effect on uh, defendants deciding whether to request counsel. And Oakland County is taking active steps to eliminate that chilling effect. Now let's talk about the Macomb County Public Defender's Office. This office has nine attorneys and five support, support personnel. Over the past year, the office made a very important hire they hired John Angie, who was a lot, who was the longtime uh, chief juvenile prosecutor in Macomb. Uh, John Angie now oversees the public defender office's district court division. And in this position, he has made uh, several important process innovations. Macomb County has a very interesting program that I wanted to highlight for people. It's called the Minuteman Investigator Program. Originally, this was a pilot program. But under this program, basically, if you were assigned to a capital case, you had nearly automatic approval of an investigator off of a list for up to five hours of investigation. So as soon as you got the case, you, you had access to an investigator and that person would be able to go out to recover video evidence, interview witnesses, you know, whatever needed to happen immediately to prevent the dissipation of evidence. Macomb also has a very nice second chair program where they offer the opportunity for attorneys who wish to gain, um, I'll call it actual time trial skills to participate in their second chair program. Um, five attorneys have signed up for the program and Macomb also makes this program available to attorneys in uh, Lapeer County. This is a picture of some of the uh, people from the public defender's office. Uh, Macomb does a lot of team building and this is a picture of a few of the staff members uh, participating in a charity challenge for the Macomb County Bar Association. And this picture looks very weird, but I think what they're doing is they're blindfolded and they're trying to put marshmallows in a bowl on their head. Not necessarily practical, but again, it's fun and it builds camaraderie. Now let's talk about the Public Defender Office in St. Clair County. This Public Defender Office has 15 attorneys and they have eight support personnel. This is the leadership team. This is uh, going from left to right. Mike Boucher, the chief public defender, Sandy Schenken, the compliance supervisor, and Frederick Le Lepley, the, the chief deputy. This is attorney Justin Gonzalez. Justin is the head of the office's veteran specialty representation team. He's also a veteran, him, veteran himself. As head of the veteran specialty representation team, Justin uh, gets involved with every case in which a veteran uh, is being prosecuted that their office is handling. Um, because of his military background, as well as his experience working in a veteran's treatment court, Justin is able to provide support to the uh, veteran client, and he's also able to assist the office in uh, ways of gathering mitigating evidence and, and ways to better serve that client. When asked about things that make the office proud, St. Clair County pointed to the lady defenders at their office. Um, they are very excited and very proud of the uh, young women who are working there and working very hard as litigators. This is the client clothes closet that St. Clair County has made available for its clients who need clothing for trial or, uh, you know, for other purposes. You may be asking yourself, why is there an emblem from the Women Lawyers Association of Michigan? And the answer to that is, these photos are photos just of men's clothes. And when I said, where are the clothes for the lady clients? They said, we don't have any. So I approached the Women Lawyers Association who took up a clothing drive. And um, basically when I hauled all the women's clothes, I was so tired, I couldn't take a picture of all the lady clothes. 
But I guess what I would say is if there's any other public defender offices out there that are interested in, in getting women's clothing, let me know because people really were coming out of the woodwork to donate clothes. This is a still from a video that the office uh, created. The office is creating a series of public information videos. This is a still from the video on what to expect uh, at your arraignment. And what you're really looking at is the attorney meeting the fictional client for the first time and talking about, here's what's gonna happen and here's the type of information uh, that I need for you. These videos are not intended to uh, supplement, to, to uh, replace the attorney-client discussion or interaction, but instead they're really just to provide additional information for people and help people become more comfortable with the, with the court process and, and have a better sense of what to expect. And then finally, as with Macomb, having a strong team and building a supportive workplace, workplace culture is very important to St. Clair County. Um, this is a picture uh, from the office's Halloween party. And as you can see, it is a very pet friendly place. But let's not forget about the third class district courts. The 41A district court in Sterling Heights no longer uses the House Council model for post arraignment representation. The 41D Royal Oak District Court has the Operation Drive program, which I've previously talked about, um, but I love talking about it, so I'm going to do it some more. Um, basically, this is a, uh, a treatment court for people without driver's licenses. The goal of the court is to provide structure, information, and encouragement since since um, March 2016, 1,312 people have acquired driver's licenses thanks to their participation in the program, and there are currently 417 people in the program today. Uh, basically, the way that the MIDC supports the program is providing the funding for the defense attorneys who counsel the defendants um, with their current case in Royal Oak, but also help the defendants clear up or adjust other issues um, that they've had concerning their licenses in other courts. <laughs> As noted here, the Royal Oak program is also able to provide vertical representation starting at arraignment for out of custody clients. So if someone comes in to Royal Oak for an arraignment, if they're a walk-in or if they're scheduled, as long as they're not in custody, the attorney that they have at their arraignment will be their attorney throughout the entire case. I'd also like to talk about the uh, D50 Pontiac uh, Indigent Defense Program. Um, the MAC team, which is a MAC, a traditional managed assigned counsel coordinator, and the MIDC coordinator uh, heavily promote the indigent defense program around the city. They frequently talk at city council meetings. Um, they also have done things like uh, have flyers distributed around the city, letting people know that they will have an attorney available at arraignment. And thanks in large part to those flyers, um, hundreds of people have turned themselves in because they knew that they wouldn't be alone when they appeared in court. So what's coming up? Well, as you heard earlier today, the process has started for, for building a public defender's office in Oakland County. That office will initially start with seven attorneys. We'll have two support personnel and an investigator. The Macomb County Public Defender's Office is also uh, going to expand. Uh, there's currently construction undergoing, and the uh, staff hopes to expand this year to 14 attorneys, 10 support people, one investigator, and one social worker. So exciting developments in this region include the fact that we're finally getting some on-staff investigators, and we're getting an on-staff social worker. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about the best region. Hopefully after this presentation, you'll understand why I say that.